property subject to the lease. So you got to make sure that you're okay with the terms of that lease. Now again, the whole idea of conditions and contingencies is to give a buyer the ability to essentially terminate the contract or the seller if these things don't occur. All right, other provisions that you're going to put into an earnest money agreement, uh, not, well, may, not always. Allocation of the purchase price. So let me explain that. So um, if you're buying a property, again, for residential, this is not as important. Um, but if you're buying a property that has, you're going to be using as a rental property or for commercial or agricultural, um, oftentimes you're going to allocate the price between the ground, the value of a building, the value of maybe an outbuilding, the value of other improvements like fencing or irrigation or other uh, things. Uh, and those, you'll allocate the purchase price and break it down and itemize it into various categories. And we do that from a depreciation standpoint because the buyer uh, may have more favorable tax treatment depending on how you allocate those, the, the price. Uh, in addition, if you're buying like a farm that has also a house on it, you're going to want to allocate how much is being attributed to the residential property because if you're the buyer, that's going to be your residential tax exclusion in the future. And then same thing with the seller, they're selling their residence, they want to allocate that to the house. The farm ground, you'd have to allocate uh, money to the farm ground, which is taxed differently than the residential part. So also, if you're selling equipment, like you're selling a farm, you're selling the ground and all the tractors and combines and tools and every, all the implements and all that, uh, those are taxed differently. So you're going to have to allocate money that goes to the farm ground and then how much is going to be allocated to the equipment, the motor vehicles, uh, like I said, the irrigation and all that. And that's something we're going to want to talk to your accountant about because the depreciation rules can be kind of intricate. Uh, that also affects how you can do a 1031 exchange. Um, if you're buying a property or selling a property that has rent, tenant deposits, and of course property taxes, you're going to want to prorate those as of closing. So uh, real, real estate taxes are, um, it's kind of weird how they do real estate taxes, the tax year is July 1 to June 30th. But the tax bill doesn't come out until November. So the tax bill is partly retroactive to July and partly proactive until the following June. And so when you go to closing, usually you know a person will pay all their property taxes at one time in November because they get a discount if they pay your taxes right away in November. So if you prepay the taxes when I sell the property, let's say I sell it in January, then I've prepaid all the way to June. So the buyer is going to have to reimburse me for that. Same thing if you have tenant deposits, those need to be transferred over to the buyer. Uh, you know, the, the seller has a bunch of cash that tenants have given them when they entered into the contract into the rental contract, and then you know those that may be prepaid rent, it may be cleaning deposits, and maybe other kinds of deposits. And, you know, that's going to have to be transferred over. And the reason why I bring that up, I've seen this happen many times, where the seller, who is a landlord, collected money from their tenants and spent it. <laughs> yeah, and we go, okay, we need that money. Uh, you weren't supposed to spend that. They did. So that's an easy fix. That's just going to come out of the sale you know, proceeds. Um, but you're going to want to make sure you prorate that uh, and make sure you know, any rent that has either been prepaid or rent that's in arrears uh, that's still owed. You're going to want to have to uh, determine how to allocate that. In Oregon, you have to have working smoke detectors. And I should also put on their carbon monoxide and in some places radon. Um, if you have a property built before uh, 1978, if I remember, uh, you have to give a lead paint and disclosure statement about lead paint. And I have a copy of that in my materials. You're going to want an attorney fee provision. That is, if something happens and you have to go to court, 
the winner will be paid their attorney fees. In Oregon, the way that works is if you don't have that in your contract, you're not entitled to attorney fees. And so that could be a huge issue if you've got a breach of contract, but you can't get your attorney fees paid. So if you're owed 10 grand, but you pay 20,000 to an attorney and you can't get that back, you're losing money. So that's a very important provision in any contract. Uh, you may uh, lose earnest money on default, refund the earnest money, I've talked about that. Uh, date of closing, when you're gonna go to closing, what title company you're gonna use. Uh, title company like Tycor Title, First American Title, Ameritidle, Lawyer's Title, there's a whole bunch of title companies. Um, and that's gonna be spelled out which title company you're gonna use to go do the title search, the title insurance, and of course to do closing. Typically speaking, just so you know, closing costs are split between the buyer and the seller equally. That is a negotiable item. Um, and depending on how bad the buyer wants it, they may agree to pay all the closing costs and vice versa. The seller may agree to pay them all. Any modifications will need to be in writing. And just so you're aware, with real estate, Real estate is subject to a law called the statute of frauds, which means everything involving real estate must be in writing or it's not enforceable in court. Can I have verbal modifications? They have to be written. Uh, they should be in the same format as the original agreement. Legal description for the property, the tax lot and assessor information for the assessor account, what kind of deed will be required, which we'll get into deeds in a minute, and then you're going to want to include access to property. So if you're going to be doing inspections, um, you know, the buyer is going to want to make sure the seller will allow them to have access to the property so your inspector can go out, your surveyor, and all of that. And you're going to want a provision in there that says uh, if there's any damage. Um, this is more for commercial. Um, if they're out there doing uh, any well testing or they're uh, doing environmental surveys, that they're going to replace the property in the condition it was before. Uh, you know, they're going to fill in any ditches or whatever that they dig. Um, and if somebody gets hurt on the property, they're going to indemnify and make sure that you're held harmless from that. Again, that's more commercial than, than residential. Okay, let's talk about title companies now. So, the purpose of a title company in, in escrow is to have a neutral third party perform a title search, like I've talked about, and then handle the funding that is getting the loan proceeds, paying off any other pre-existing loans that the seller had, arranging for signature and notary, and then recording the documents, including the deed and loan documents with the county uh, once the proceeds have been received and paid out. Title company will also arrange and determine and itemize the prorations that I talked about, taxes, um, utilities, tenant deposits, etc. The title company will issue a title report, like I've talked about already, and normally you will have what's called title insurance. So title insurance is usually, just so you know, uh, the premium, the cost, is traditionally paid by the seller. The cost will, I don't really have an exact amount, but um, I'm trying to think of when I did recently. I, recently we had, a, it was a half million dollar more or less sale and the title insurance was about $800. So you know, it's a significant expense. Um, so title insurance, basically the point of title insurance is to give the buyer protection in the event that there's a problem that shows up with the title in the future. In addition, you'll have a, what's called a lender's endorsement, and that is uh, coverage that will give insurance to the lender. Uh, again, that's typically paid by the seller, although that is also negotiable. It's not uncommon. I'd say 75% of the time it's paid by the seller. The remaining 25% it's either split or the buyer pays it. So that is a negotiable item, but for the most part, traditionally it's paid by the seller. The title company will pay off any loans at the time of closing. 
And again, they will arrange for the closing. Um, that is, they'll bring people in, have them sign all the documents, notarize, verify their identity, and all of that. And then if you're going to have a seller carry contract, which we'll talk about in a minute, that's essentially uh, where the buyer will make payments directly to the seller and you won't have a, a bank involved, then um, you're going to want that to go through what's called an escrow collection company. And that is a company that will collect payments from the buyer and then give them to the seller and they'll keep track of the payments. They'll have an itemized running balance on the loan and they'll also issue the tax forms every year that are required, 1098 form. And um, like Sandy and Escrow does that. Uh, and that's always a good idea. That way if there's ever a dispute, you can have them give you an exact up-to-date balance on the loan, how much interest has been paid, how much principal is remaining. Um, if you're going to do that, you know, this is a private type transaction where I'm buying property from you directly. Um, we want somebody to keep track of how much is owed because my books are going to differ, differ from your books. I guarantee it. And then you get into a big fight and nobody knows what's accurate, what's not. You got to try to recreate it, especially if you have payments like maybe somebody skipped two months and then they prepaid three months and how do you allocate that between principal and interest and they have software that does that. So that's not that expensive. The cost for that is usually split equally by the parties. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. Just kind of keep going in order. So let's talk about deeds. A deed is the document, like a title to a car, that will transfer ownership of the property from the buyer to the seller or will function as a release or transfer of any interest that you possibly hold in the property, uh, even if it's not a, a sale transaction, or if it's a gift, that will transfer title uh, as a gift. So we basically have a number of different kinds of deeds uh, that we use in Oregon, and this could generate some confusion. So I'm going to start at the top, which is the most basic, and this is called a quit claim deed. A QC deed or a quit claim deed. You may have heard that term before. A quit claim deed is basically where someone is saying, I am transferring to you whatever ownership or other rights I have in the property, if any. I am not guaranteeing you I have any rights at all. I may not have anything. But if I do, you now have whatever I have. I call this a release deed basically, in my own mind. And the idea of a quick claim deed, or the way they're used, is in several areas. Number one, uh, if I just want to give you property and I don't want to have any you know, representations or warranties, there may be an issue with whether or not I actually own the property or something like that. I can quick claim it over to somebody. I'll deed it to them. They take over whatever ownership interest I have. I uh, use these commonly in a dissolution of marriage case where the spouse that's giving up the property as part of the divorce decree will release it to the other spouse that's going to keep the house. We'll usually do that through a quick claim. Or maybe, like I told you before, we have a case where we had to go back to the 1800s and find all the possible heirs. And once we started finding people, basically we would say, um, if you're not going to claim something in court, will you sign a quick claim releasing whatever rights you may have over to us? And, you know, we, we usually pay them a little bit for that just for convenience. So essentially it's a transfer of whatever rights you have, if any. All right, a bargain and sale deed is a very common form of deed where you're transferring ownership, but you're not making any warranties or guarantees about the amount of ownership that you have. It's, a little, it's different than a quick claim deed because you are saying that you are the owner, but beyond that, you're not guaranteeing title or anything else. A special or limited warranty deed is essentially where you're transferring ownership. You are the owner, but you're saying that there's some issue with the property. Usually, we're going to do that in a situation where we may have what's called a wrap loan. Let me explain that for a moment. 
This is typically when a seller uh, is selling property to a buyer directly on a contract, no bank involved, and the, there is a loan that the seller has on the property, a pre-existing loan, that the seller will continue to pay while the buyer is making payments to them. So the buyer makes a payment, the seller then will make a payment to their lender until their lender's paid off. And if you do that, of course, that property is not free and clear. And so you can't guarantee it's free and clear. Or if there are easements that are subject or uh, an assumption of a loan, other things like that. Or a long-term lease, like for agricultural purposes, that's going to be there for, you know, like a, a vineyard lease, which may go on for 30 years, uh, those kind of things. And then finally, and this is what you would normally want if you're a buyer, a statutory warranty deed. This is full warranty of title. This is where the seller is guaranteeing that they are the owner and that there are no problems with the title to the property other than any type of problems the buyer has agreed to. And that's generally speaking what uh, a bank is gonna require uh, unless they specifically agree to one of the lesser quality deeds, if you will. All right, a couple of others here just to talk about real fast. Transfer on death deed. These are fairly new in Oregon. Um, this essentially allows you, if you're the owner of property, to put down on the deed who you want to inherit that property after you die. And that way, if you pass away, like in my case, I would name my children, and that way, I have their names on the deed. They're not owners now. They don't become an owner until I die. But that way, they don't have to go to court after I die. A real handy way to avoid probate and going to court is to do a transfer on death deed. Now, there are some issues with them. You can't be very complex and have like contingencies on who will get the property. It has to be pretty straightforward, like to my three children equally or to the survivor if one of them dies too. Um, those are revocable. So as long as I'm alive, I can change my mind, I can revoke it. My kids have no rights to the property whatsoever until I die. And then finally, a trust deed. This is the name of the document that a lender, like a bank, will use to secure the loan against the real estate. This creates a form of a lien or encumbrance on the property. And what that means is if you sell the property in the future, the bank has to get paid because they have a lien against that property. And in order to clear that lien, clear the trust deed, they'll have to file, it's called a deed of reconveyance, that is to clean out that lien. And if they don't get paid, then they can go after and foreclose uh, on the trust deed. So this is your basic bank loan document that will... Uh, formalize the bank loan itself. Okay. So I just want to show you some of the paperwork I have in here because, um, so just to give you an idea. So this is that lead based paint disclosure. Oh, I forgot to bring my button here. So um, if you are buying a property which is built prior to 1978, or I should say selling a property prior to 78, then you have to notify a buyer that there is the potential of lead paint on the property. Even if you don't know of any, you still have to declare that. And if you do know of it, you have to uh, declare that you do know about the lead-based paint, or if you're not sure, you say you don't have any knowledge. And you also have to provide this cool little booklet which I did not give you, I just gave you the first page. Uh, but this is available on the internet. This is the uh, EPA's book booklet on lead-based lead -based paint. Um, you know, it's not as much of a problem nowadays, but um, older homes almost invariably are going to have lead-based paint, which you may need to do cleanup on. All right, this next form is a mandatory form under Oregon law. This is called a seller's property disclosure statement. And this is a form that if you're selling residential property, with a few exceptions, you have to provide this form to the buyer where they can basically terminate the transaction at any time. There are exceptions if 
the sale is for a brand new home, or if it's by a financial institution in a foreclosure, or if it's a court-appointed situation, including the death of a person in an estate. And if you're handling their estate, you, know, you don't know the condition of the property like the owner did that died, uh, and or if it's by a governmental entity. And so you can just kind of see, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but um, this is a standardized form. You can get this off the internet. Um, do you have legal authority to sell a property? Yes, no, unknown. You got to check the box. Uh, are there any encroachments or boundary disputes? Yes, no, unknown. So it's pretty self-explanatory. So again, this is a form that you as the seller have to provide to the buyer. Now, if you have a real estate agent, they'll do this form for you. If you're not using a real estate agent, you'll have to provide this form yourself. And I just want to show you something down here. I don't know how well it turned out. Not very good, but... Well, you can hardly read that. Let me write it down. Okay. Stevens Ness. That's the name of the publishing company that produces these forms. And you can buy this, they have a website, and you can buy it online and type it in online or get a hard copy form. Uh, they also have a version of this form in, that has uh, carbon copies, uh, you know, white page, a pink page, a yellow page, and I think a green page if I remember. I don't use that, I just do it online now. But um, that's the name of the publisher where you can also get other kinds of real estate documents if you're selling the property yourself. And then the final, and there, are, there are three pages to the form. And then, let's go over to here. I give you an example of a, a pretty basic, I didn't want to get too complex, form. This is a derivative of the form I use in my practice for a pretty basic sale. But this is that earnest money purchase and sale agreement that I was talking about. This is what you use to start the sale transaction. So just to go through a little bit of it, I'm not gonna go through every little bit, but essentially, buyer or seller will sell and buyer will purchase the property at 1234 Fantasyland Drive. This is Donald Duck and Mickey Mouse, by the way. And then we're gonna have the legal description. The legal description is the survey description that's on record with the county. That is the, that's what identifies that piece of ground. The address itself may not have any relevance whatsoever, especially in farmland. That may not even have an address, you know, in the middle of nowhere. So the legal description is the survey description. And that's also what the title company will do as part of the title report is they will verify that legal description. And then I always include the address if there is one, the tax account number, there may be more than one property tax account for a particular property. And then there's a map and tax lot, that's the uh, plat map that the assessor will do. And there may be more than one tax lot, especially if it crosses uh, county lines or uh, different parts of a legal description, crosses um, township lines and that kind of thing. All right, then you'll outline the terms of the purchase. Next page over. And so you can see right here, we're gonna identify who is the title company, when you're gonna to go to closing. Oh, I forgot to show you, I'm sorry, page one. How much earnest money will be down, put down. And then the buyer will provide a check payable to the title company for such amount and it will be deposited and at closing the amount will be applied towards the purchase price. And then we'll outline the rest of the terms. So if there's gonna be additional cash down payment, and then how much will be for the loan. Closing will take place. We put the date of the title company, and then all closing, recording, and other fees will be split equally. Cost for title insurance paid by the seller. Buyer will be responsible for payment of cost any lender or other title insurance that the lender may require, uh, along with any, uh, and here's where I talk about the buyer will pay for all of the inspections or that kind of thing. Um, and then we have a paragraph about when closing will occur, 
what kind of deed will have to be issued. Always like to include a provision about personal property. Just a real quick on that. There are two types of property, real property and personal property. Real property is land, real estate, and anything attached to it, which we call a fixture, like a fence post. Personal property are things that are not attached to the land. So appliances that you plug into the wall, for example, like a dishwasher, well, not a dishwasher, a clothes washer, or a refrigerator, except for those high-end ones that are all hardwired. Essentially, anything that's not hardwired as an appliance, like a big TV or something, that's called personal property. Personal property does not go along with the sale of the property unless you specifically include it. So if you're buying property and you want to make sure the big screen TV is going to be left on the property, you want to make sure you specify that. Washer, dryer, window coverings, satellite dish, hot tub, anything like that that may not be attached permanently, you're going to want to list that out. Like a shed. Too. A shed, uh, lawnmowers, you know, things like that. All right, so here's where I go through all those conditions. And I'm not, I've already talked about them all, but this is where, like I say, you're going to want to specify very, in writing very clearly what are the conditions that would allow the buyer or the seller to modify or terminate the contract. And then you can see here, it goes into lang language about when does the buyer have to tell you that they're terminating. And I usually do that five days before closing. Uh, so the buyer is going to say we're bailing. They've got to give you advance notice. That way you're not surprised. If any repairs are going to be made by the seller, that's where we'll detail that out. Here, put none. Property sold as is. Taxes will be prorated at closing. Possession. Buyer will be entitled to possession at the date of closing. Now, again, that's an issue sometimes. I recently had a case where the seller was buying another property, but they were waiting to buy, sell this property, and their property wasn't going to be open. So essentially, the seller stayed in the house for a month after the buyer bought it. And that's like... And they rented it back from the buyer, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, the as it is, is that common? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Even, um, if, even if, like, foundation is... Settling. That's what the earnest money and that inspection is for. So if the buyer determines they don't like the foundation, they can bail or renegotiate the price. Gotcha. So if they find out that uh, the foundation is bad, uh, then they can negotiate that the seller uh, pay for it to be fixed before they buy. Yeah, you can pay for it to be fixed or reduce the price down and then the buyer will fix it. Okay, this is where we talk about the title insurance. Um, again, I'm not going to get into all that, but it details all the title insurance. Um, and the rest of this is pretty self-explanatory. So here's that as is, like you were just talking about. Um, buyer accepts property and land as is. Buyer will be solely responsible for determining the fitness and condition of the property. Um, and then, essentially, if there's a problem, the buyer can bail or renegotiate. And then the disclosure statements and all that. So I'm not going to go through every little detail. Okay, one last little thing I want to talk about is um, for sale by owner. I'm going to find my page here. Hold on. Seller carry transactions. So seller carry, you'll see these a lot, um, you know, in an ad. Well, not a lot recently, but now we probably will see this more often now that interest rates are going up pretty high. It's hard to get a loan. So there are ba basically two ways that you can buy a property. Well, three. Number one, you can pay cash. <laughs> Number two, you can get a loan. Or the third way is if the seller is willing to carry a contract. Right here. 
So this basically is a private transaction where you don't have a bank. And these are not uncommon. They're not as common as a bank loan, but um, basically this will work out where the parties agree to a sale price, and then the buyer is going to make payments directly to the seller without there being a loan. And, you know, they're going to charge interest just like you would on a bank loan. Uh, sometimes you're going to charge a higher interest rate than a bank because you're taking the risk that the person may default. You're not getting cash right now. Also, if you're a seller and you're going to carry a contract, that's going to ruin your ability to do a 1031. You can't do a tax-free exchange on a seller carried contract because you're getting payments. So every payment is that getting taxed? Well, yeah, you're still going to get taxed. Um, the, ta the way the taxes are paid they're based upon when you receive the payment, yeah. not the whole amount at once, because okay. otherwise you wouldn't have the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So just. Every, but yeah, that's a great question. You get, yeah, that's so. called that's called the installment method of tax reporting. Gotcha. So you pay. So if I'm getting, let's say, a thousand dollars a month in a payment, I'm going to allocate that thousand dollars. How much is interest, which I'll pay tax on? How much of its capital gain, and how much is my basis? So out of that $1,000, we'll break it down, and then each time I get a payment, it's called installment method. And that's, that's true for any, if I'm selling you a semi-truck or a tractor or anything. So there are two ways you can do this. One is through what's called a land sale contract, and the other is through a trust deed. Trust deed, like I talked about earlier, is you, what the bank will use, but uh, you can also use it in a private transaction. A land sale contract is essentially a contract, kind of like the earnest money contract, only it's more detailed. And that outlines the terms. If the buyer doesn't make a payment, then the seller can forfeit the contract, and basically the buyer loses everything they paid, and the seller gets it back. I'm not going to go into the nuances there, but I'll just let you know, if you're going to sell property... It's better for you to sell it on a contract rather than a trustee because you, you as the seller have more rights under a land sale contract if the buyer defaults. On a trust deed, essentially you have two options. You either go to court or you have a public auction. Um, and then you're paid back what you're owed plus costs. In a land sale contract, you might get the property back 100% and you get to keep all the payments the buyer made to you. So you're in a much better position as a seller. Now it gets kind of technical after that, more so than I want to go into in this class, but I just want you to be aware of that. Um, so if you're selling, you want to sell on a contract. If you're buying, you want to buy it on a trustee. Um, and then also you can do it, like I talked about earlier, if the buyer cannot afford to make a down payment, you, you as the seller can carry a second loan that would be behind the bank loan in second position. And then if then the, they can get a loan, pay you off for most of the balance, and then you get payments on the rest of it. So. Any questions?